ahead. We can actually just go ahead. Uh, please, Pacific, don't mind opening for us, and we'll get started. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for today. Today you have made. We are rejoicing and we are glad because you have preserved our life. And we are confident that you are going to preserve us until we see you in glory. Please accept our thanks in Jesus' name. We gather in your name and we ask that by your spirit you lead us even from the beginning to the end of this webinar. We want to know your will, your counsel for us in our finances as well as areas of that we pray that you will reveal your mind to us and you want the wisdom to be able to run with it in Jesus. Pray for all we ask for divine wisdom, we ask for revelation spirit. We ask that God that at the end all of us together will know we have been increased webinar and i pray with thanksgiving in jesus name amen amen thank you ma uh you know for those of you that may not know that uh that's our pastor's wife uh, mrs binkbe ishola also we are privileged to have a pastor on the line as well pastor daniel ishola as well uh the both pastor you know our local assembly here in columbus ohio so RCCG is our friend chapel. Uh, so we're, we're wow, well, um, you know, they've really given us the support to really go out there to uh, as much as we can, you know, for Christ, for the glory of, you know, for the glory of God. So that's one of the reasons why we would put this together, just to connect with, you know, our members and folks that are not our members as well, uh, to really think about you know, money, especially in this time of, you know, pandemic and all, and all of that. So, so really quickly, I'll open the floor and um, I would not introduce this, uh, the facilitators. I will be moderating, I will allow the facilitator to introduce themselves very briefly and, um, and we'll go from there. So after every session, um, we will take maybe a few questions. So since this is a webinar, we have an option on the chat. So you can use the chat box uh, to send your questions in. Also, just a heads up, this is also being recorded uh, just for you know, other attendees to be able to play back uh, when they want to. So if you don't want to hear your voice being recorded, please just send your you know, questions to the chat box. Uh, chances are somebody will be able to benefit from your question. So please, please, please do not be shy. Um, of course, there's going to be questions specific to each session, and there's going to be general questions as well. So just keep that in mind. Um, also, uh, there's going to be a few. Uh, we're going to ask for your feedback at the end of this, uh, uh, you know, the whole presentation. So just have your notes, your pen and paper, and we'll, you'll take that information for feedback uh, for this uh, for the whole uh, presentation as well. So. So we'll go right into it. So just let me know, confirm if you could see my slide, you could send yes to the chat box uh, really quickly. If you could see the agenda um, on the screen and I'll walk through that, just send yes to the chat box uh, really quickly. I see one yes. Um, yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for that. Okay, great. So what we're going to do, um, I will later. I will. Okay. So, so first thing first, we're going to talk about finance and asset classes, right? Uh, that's the first thing. Why are we here? We want to have a really broad understanding of what are asset classes? What does that mean exactly? Uh, then we're going to go into what's called market drivers. What drives the market? What drives, you know, the economy? You know, when is a good time to invest and how? You know, how can I invest? So those are the things that we're going to cover on this call. Um, on this next slide here, so these are our facilitators. Obviously, I will be moderating. Um, and, and starting from left to right is Kayode Agbabiaka. Again, he will introduce himself uh, properly. I don't want to miss uh, <laughs> any, of the, any of the degrees or accolades uh, this, this, peop this fine people have. But I can tell you, I mean, everybody on this 
you know, slide are really, you know, friends, you know, to me. Coyote and I, uh, we are part of the Young Adult Singles Ministry nationally for Redeemed Christian Church of God. Uh, so we've been friends since then. It's been a while, over 10 years. Uh, same with Precious as well. Precious used to attend our church here locally in Columbus, uh, attended Ohio State University, um, you know, graduated with an engineering degree. But again, I'll let her share more about herself. And, and of course, you know, Deacon Akin Ayemabola, I worked uh, directly on his team for about a year and a half. Uh, we worked at the same company uh, before he moved to Texas. As you can see, you know, Kaede is from the East Coast. Uh, you know, Deacon Akin and Precious are from South and I am here in Columbus, Ohio. So, you know, these three folks would really be walking us through, again, those three topics that we've talked about. Okay, without further ado, uh, Kaede, I will turn it over to you, maybe share a brief introduction and maybe just kick us off. Thank you, Kuli, for the wonderful introduction. I hope everyone can hear me. Yep. Okay, good. So it's it's a pleasure being with you all. Um, uh, I am really delighted about the opportunity to speak on this topic. Um, you know, just by way of introduction, I'll keep it simple. Uh, my name is Kayode Akbabi I am based in New York. I am a finance professional. I work in two fields, uh, the retirement industry and also in taxes. So um, those are my background. I studied uh, financial economics. I have a master's degree in financial economics and I've been working in finance things. Um, so to go straight into what we're talking about tonight, um, equity, investing in equity uh, stocks, if you will. But before I get into uh, stocks, basically, it will be, I will talk briefly on the other aspect classes, just so that we know stocks is not the only asset class, uh, and also because stocks is not for everybody. You know, it's very lucrative, but depending on your investment horizon, how long you want to stay invested, and depending on your risk tolerance, uh, it may not be for you. So we'll get into the other assets classes briefly, but we'll spend more time on stocks and investing in stocks. So that's what the agenda for me for tonight. So Kule, I think I've done enough with the introduction. Thank you. So the asset classes, I mean, I'm going to talk about, there are plenty more, you know, I'm sure the next speaker will speak about real estate, which is also one of the asset classes. But I'm just going to talk about these three main uh, ones. Uh, and I'm going to, you know, start with equity. Uh, and then we'll go into fixed income. And then we'll go into cash equivalent. Again, like I said, um, you may, uh, depending on your time arising, you may not want to invest in stock market. What do I mean? Um, if some people are saving for a, uh, they're saving towards something. Let's say a house. I see the picture of a beautiful house in the background. You're saving for a house and you want to be able to purchase your house next year or in the next three months. You just, just need somewhere to keep your money and you want a little bit of interest. On your that money is probably not suitable for the stock market because the stock market fluctuates a lot. And if your investment horizon is three months, uh, you don't want to put it in the stock market because a lot can happen in three months. It can go too low or it can go very high and you can lose a lot or you can gain a lot. So you don't want to take that chance. Uh, so that leaves you with uh, the two other asset class. Uh, fixed income, for example, uh, fixed income, they, those are guaranteed investments, although they are not as profitable as stocks, but they are very guaranteed. So if you have if you have some money that you are putting to the side to buy a house in the next three, six months, you want to put that money in a fixed income. Fixed income could be uh, bonds, basically, government bonds or commercial bonds from uh, private companies. Uh, that are doing well and these bonds if you buy them they will your your capital is guaranteed and then on top of that you will get an interest 
Some of them pay interest monthly, some of them pay it quarterly, some of them pay it annually, but you can never lose your investment. So your money is safe, plus you get a little bit on top of it. Uh, there is also cash equivalent, which is the CD, money market. I mean, those are a little bit better than your uh, savings account because why savings accounts are giving you maybe 0.2%, these CDs and money market may give you actually maybe 2%. Uh, so they are better than your regular savings account, but they are not as great as fixed income and they may not be as great as stocks. But hey, again, how, you know, how, what's your risk tolerance? Some people can't take risk. You know, if they lose $100, they buy contemplate suicide. So those people have no business in the stock market. You know, they either put their money in a fixed income or in the cash equivalent account. So um, without you know, spending much time on that, because I have very limited time, we'll go into the next slide, talking about stocks. What are, what are stocks? What are equity? You know, equity, uh, when you buy a stock, what are you really doing? Uh, you, it gives you a right of ownership. So uh, McDonald's, every other major company that are traded on the stock market, they give you an opportunity to buy into them. So if you buy a share of McDonald's, you become a part owner of McDonald's. So by being a part owner, whatever profit McDonald's brings in at the end of the year, you share in it. If they take a loss, you also share in their loss. Um, equities are highly volatile. They are very, very, I mean, the price, in the morning and the closing price in the evening could vary a lot. I mean, there are some stocks that I, I believe it was uh, last week I was watching these stocks and it started out at uh, maybe $20 in the morning. And by afternoon, these stocks went from $20 to 134. That's how volatile stocks are. And again, something, the same way it went up, it can also go down. Imagine a stock that started out in the morning being $100, and by afternoon, it's gone down to $20. Imagine people who, are, who have $10,000 in these stocks. That means their $10,000 just went down to $2,000. Some people will have a heart attack. So hey, if you're one of those people who can't take risk, you have no business you know, investing in stocks. It's highly volatile. Uh, it, it's again, it's suitable for medium to long term investment. Like I said, if your intent for your money is a short term one, uh, you have no business investing that money in the stock market. So let's be mindful of that. Uh, stock markets, are, um, equities, stocks are very, they are very profitable in the long run. And mind you, the profits that you make on the stocks, so you bought. Uh, say Apple for twenty dollars, you hold it for like five years. Now it's three hundred dollars, and then you cash out. Whenever you cash out of a equity position, you have taxable event. So the profit on the on the sale is taxable. In the same way, the losses that you get from the sale of a stock is also tax deductible. So either way you gain. When you sell for profit, your profit is taxable. When you sell at a loss, so don't be afraid, all is not lost when you really lose money in the stock market because it, the loss is taxable, uh, it's tax deductible. Uh, and the rate of tax that you paid is really different, it varies. So if you owned a stock for less than a year before you trade it for profit, I mean, you pay a higher rate of taxes but if you hold a stock for more than a year and then you sold it you pay a lower rate of tax which is called the capital gain tax so just be mindful of your holding period you know if you want to pay higher tax you know you can sell it before a year if you hold it for more than a year you will be saving on taxes you pay lower taxes uh, next slide please Thank you. So now what are some of the ways to invest in stocks? I mean, there is the direct way, you know, anyone with a phone in the US today, you have a phone, you have a computer, uh, and you have a social security number, you need a social security number. 
once you have those two, you have access to any stocks whatsoever, as long as you have the funds available. So you can go directly. You don't need a broker to help you buy a stock. Before it used to be that you need to set up a brokerage account, you need to go to Wells Fargo or one of those big companies and set up an account. But now, nowadays you don't have to do that anymore. Um, so you can invest directly and you can buy individual stocks. You can buy stocks of Apple, you can buy uh, Chipotle, you can buy any company that's traded on the market today. Uh, but there are several challenges with that. I mean, challenge number one is, look, there, on the New York Stock Exchange alone, there are close to 3,000 3, individual stocks. So how do you know which one to buy and which one not to buy? You know, how do you know when to buy and when not to buy? Those are challenges that, look, unless you are trained, unless you know what you're doing, you will just be gambling. It will just be like going to Vegas or, uh, you know, or a lot of people invest based on their emotions. You know, hey, you know, a lot is going on with Apple today and then they hear that and then they go out and buy. You know, um, you know, the other challenge is there are a lot of work that goes into picking stocks. I mean, the professionals, there's technical analysis, there's a financial analysis, looking at the books, looking at the market value and the book value, comparing that, is there a deal or is not, you know, before they buy. The professionals don't just buy, but if you are an individual, a lay person on the streets, you know, you don't have all of these skill sets, you know, just basically flying blind, buying based off of your emotion or what you heard in the news and whatnot. Um, so those are the challenges, uh, but the, you know, the good side of it is it's, it's cheaper this way. If you have to buy directly and individually, because imagine if you have to, if you have to have an intermediary, if you have to pay, uh, have a broker, you will of course pay the broker a service fee. But if you can invest directly, you cut out the middleman, you save the money, you know, the, the fee for the middleman. And, and then you have control, you know, you can buy and sell whenever you, you know, if you are the type that love to have control over your asset, you can trade anytime you want, you can buy and whatever you want, you can do, basically you're in the driver's seat, you can buy and sell whenever you want, nobody's telling you anything. Um, the, the cons of that is, it's very risky because you really basically don't know what you're doing. You're just trading based off of your emotion. And the second thing is it's time consuming. You know, you, you have to spend a lot of time listening to the news, analyzing the stocks, you know, what's going on, what's not going on, and knowing what to buy, you know, that takes a lot of time and, and everything. So there are pros and there are cons to going to the market directly and cutting out the middleman and doing it yourself. You save money, you have control, but then again, time consuming, do you know what you're doing? Maybe not. So those are you know, the pros and the cons. Um, let's go, what are the other ways to purchase uh, equity if you don't want to do the direct way? Um, there are mutual funds. So mutual funds, now the control is taken from you, it's given to a fund manager. Mutual funds have fund managers. These fund managers are provided are finance professionals, they're stockbrokers, they, this is what they do for a living. So they analyze the stock market, they know the stocks that are good, the, the ones to avoid and all of that, and they build a portfolio. They buy a collection of stocks, the good ones, the, you know, the ones with potential from across different sector, they put it in a portfolio. They, they get money from individual investors who don't know what to do, what to buy, who are willing to relinquish control to them. They take money from these people and then they invest the money in the stocks that they have picked. So some of the um, highlights is, you know, the portfolio is diversified. Uh, like you, one of the basic rules of investment is don't put all of your egg in one basket. Some of us, if we have to go to the stock market to buy stocks today, we'll just probably buy from one sector because, oh, maybe the technology sector, technology is booming. You buy Google, you buy Apple, you buy, but you're still buying from one industry. What happens if that industry suffers tomorrow? All of your money might be gone. So professionals, the mutual funds are very well diversified. Uh, there is professional management uh, with mutual funds. The professional managers know what to buy. 
they know when to buy, they know when to sell. And you know, if there are new things coming to the market, they know which one to embrace, which one to avoid, and all of that. Um, so along with that professional management, there is the fees. So you have the transactional fees. Every time they buy and sell stocks from the portfolio, from the mutual fund, they have to pay a fee. Uh, and then operational fee, you know, when they send you those documents uh, that you get at the end of the year or quarterly statements, I mean, they call it expense. You know, uh, those things, the operational cost, they take those from your account. Uh, there's also the managerial fee, which is for the fund managers. I mean, they're not working for free. They're working for their fee. So whatever the mutual fund brings in, all of these costs are deducted. And then whatever is left is your profit. So of course, if you do the direct uh, investment, you wouldn't have to incur some of this, um, all of these fees. You can keep your money to yourself. But this way, I mean, you're getting professional management but at a cost. Uh, next slide, Steve. Yep. All right, so the, the pros, basically we, we've gone over it, the pros of mutual funds, you know, that you're getting professional management. Imagine someone with a finance degree, someone with 20 years of experience trading in the stock market, buying and selling on your behalf, managing your money. That's a lot of confidence. That's a lot of, peace of mind for you and there's diversification they know to buy across the different sectors they're not just buying on based on emotion your, your portfolio is very balanced and then the risk of losing money is very low when you diversify the risk is very low uh, as opposed to when you buy you know emotionally um what are some of the cons or owning a mutual fund is i uh, i mean choosing the right fund is you know it's a challenge because there are millions and millions of mutual funds out there there are different companies there's vanguard there's schwab there is uh, fidelity there's a lot of companies and all those companies have like 10 20 different mutual funds so how do you know which one to buy how do you know which company to go with that's a challenge you know uh, and also uh, mutual fund have all of them always have initial funding requirement you know to open a mutual fund account you probably need a minimum of 1k some of them as high as five thousand dollars so for a small investor it might be difficult getting into a mutual fund because you don't have the initial requirement uh mutual fund can be expensive you know like i said there's a transactional fee the operational fee the managerial fee all of this fee, you know, taken from your profit at the end of the day, how much are you? I mean, it's true that they make you a lot of money, but by the time the fees are taken out, how much money do you really have in your pocket? And um, the, the last, uh, for me, I think uh, the last con is there are no guarantees. You know, when you go to the market yourself, you go directly and you buy individual stocks, there are no guarantees, you know. You're basically flying blind. You don't know. Again, when you give your money to professionals you would expect that there should be at least some guarantees there are no guarantees guess what they can lose money your the mutual fund can lose the mutual fund can you know become negative everything is gone wiped out and you can't sue anybody it's you know a, to the best of their knowledge they invested but i mean again think about what's happening to the market right now nobody saw it coming it came, nobody planned for it. If it wiped out the market, who can you really blame? Nobody. So they, but at least to the best of their knowledge, they will do what they know to do, but there are no guarantees. So you're paying all of those fees, but you're not getting any guarantees. So that takes us to uh, the third, um, third ways to invest in equity. Uh, you could do mutual funds, you could do in the, uh, direct, uh, there is also the exchange traded fund. So the exchange traded fund works more like a mutual fund because it's also a collection of stocks. You know, uh, it's usually, but but the difference is that while mutual fund invest, mutual fund pick and choose different stocks to put in their portfolio. 
with index funds, they don't pick and choose. They buy the whole market. They buy the whole market or a sector of the market. For example, there are index fund VTSAX, invest in all of the stocks in America, period. All of the stocks are bought and put in that portfolio. There are other index funds that will buy the S&P 500. You know, the, the S&P 500 are the largest 500 companies in America. They just buy all of it. Or there's the technology um, index. You know, just all of the technology companies in America, they just buy and keep. That's all. So they are not picking and choosing like the mutual fund. They're just buying either the whole market or a sector of the market. Um, the underlining stocks. So with mutual funds, they buy and sell. When, you know, they, they buy low, sell high. If the stock is, you know, getting out of style, they sell it off. They bring new ones in. But with uh, ETF, they never trade these stocks. They just buy them and keep them. That's it. Uh, they are, you know, so there is, this is what they call passive investing. Mutual funds have active management. You know, they're, they're very active. Um, these ETFs are managed by fund managers, just like um, mutual funds. Uh, and now, compared to mutual funds, ETFs are actually low cost because they are not actively traded. Although they are professional managers, but they do very little as opposed to mutual funds. So if you're looking to, you know, if you're thinking in terms of cost, ETF is probably your best bet. In terms of results, you can analyze and come to your own conclusion which one is better. Uh, but if, if cost is one of your concern, ETF is probably your best bet. So let's look at some of the pros and cons of um, ETFs. So the ETF, much like the mutual fund, there's professional management. There is, you know, someone with 20 years of experience managing your account. That gives you a lot of peace of mind. There is diversification. Is you know, imagine across the market everything, or imagine the S and P 500, the biggest 500 from across all sector. I mean, the whole market cannot go down at once. So you're very diversified. Uh, the risk is very low. Unlike mutual fund, though, there is no barrier to entry. You know, mutual fund has a minimum initial requirement, like 1,000 to 5,000. With ETFs, there are no, no such barrier. You, know, you, you can start off by the cheapest one you can buy. Um, the cons for me, you know, and those who love investing and, you know, the daily abracadabra that happens, is this is very boring imagine just buying a set of stocks and not trading it not even thinking about it you just just forget about it you just basically put your money there and forget about it it's very boring for people who you know are market observers um, so and again finding the right etf you know again there are so many companies trading these things so which company is the best who charge the lowest fee and where can you get a deal and all of that you know it's it's a lot of work so those are the three ways that you can invest in equity so you pick and choose which one suits you and um, you go with it so we're just going to look at now some market trends you know part of the reason we're having this conversation is trying to take advantage of this um, situation that we're in. Is it a good time to buy? That's one of the questions you get. Um, the market is down. Everybody is running out. Should you be running in? Uh, Warren Buffett says, get greedy when everybody's afraid and be afraid when everybody's greedy. So a time like this, when everybody's rushing out of the market, you know, according to financial wisdom, it's one of the best times to buy. Um, so we'll look at stocks of Apple. Uh, let's look at what has happened to them. You see um, the 52-week range. You know, that's usually one of the uh, most common way to analyze stocks. Uh, you know, the lowest and the highest they have been in the past one year. So how much has been the lowest and the highest in the past one year? Uh, the lowest has been 170. And the highest it's been in one year is 327. It's a wild range. Now, let's look at what's happened uh, during this pandemic. Now, you see what I circled on the historical prices. Uh, March 23rd, 
was when they had their lowest moment during the pandemic. So the stock fell to 212. That was on March 23. But look at what the price is as of uh, April 7, which is the chart on the left. Now it has bounced back from 212 to 282. That's a lot of bounce back within a month period. So a lot of people are thinking maybe the worst is over. And if you invested at 212, you already made $60. Imagine you have 10 of this, how much money you have right now in profit. I mean, am I telling you to, it's too late now? I'm not saying that. Am I telling you it's time to buy? I'm telling you that. You know, I can't give you any financial advice, but just looking at trends, basically. Uh, let's look at the next stocks um, that I that I follow very closely. Uh, Chipotle. Many of us probably eat at Chipotle. Unfortunately, well, unfortunately or unfortunately, I am one person. I've never eaten from Chipotle. You know, I don't really do Chipotle, but I've been investing in Chipotle for more than maybe four or five years now, just buying and selling the stocks because it's very lucrative. Now, um, let's look at a 52 week range. It's 415 to 940. So the lowest has been in the last one year is 415, and the highest has been is 940. The lowest was actually, actually happened on March 18. So if you look at the historical prices to the right. It hit the bottom on March 18 during the pandemic, it went to 415. And now let's look at what has happened from March 18 to now. Now, as of 4 7, April 7, the stock has bounced back from 415 to 820. That's almost 100% bounce back in less than a month. As of yesterday, Chipotle was trading for 900 plus as of yesterday. So, hey, bad times, are they really good times to invest or a time to run away from the market? You be the judge. And is it still, have you lost out on the opportunity? Can it grow more? Again, you be the judge. Uh, let's move quickly to, the, I think the third one and the last one that I, this is one stock that I also follow closely. Um, Havana, I mean, they are, you know, it's, it's the new way to buy and sell used cars. If you want to buy a used car without leaving your home, you go to Kavana, they have cars in uh, like, like vending machine. You know, you, you can pick and choose the one you want and they'll deliver the car right to your house and, you know, give you the key and that's it. And if you don't like it, within a month or so, you call them and they'll come and pick it up. And, you know, they're thinking it's the way of the future. Uh, let's look at the 52-week range. 52-week range is actually $22 to $115. So it was $115 shortly before the pandemic. So when the pandemic hits, it went to $22 March 19. You see what I circle in the historical price? March 19, it went to uh, $22. It hit the bottom. As of April 7, it's trading at $78. As of today, it's trading at $93. Just imagine, barely a month after, it's trading at $93. That's what I said about stocks. They are highly volatile. They can go way up in short period and they can come way down. So in short period, so if be careful investing in stock. You can make money overnight. You can also lose a fortune overnight. So these are some of the stocks that I, you know, that I'm that I watch closely. This is some of the opportunities that I've seen, some of the trend that I've seen in the market. Uh, I mean, you know, feel free to follow the stock that you follow. Follow it for a while before you actually decide to invest and all the best in your investment. At this point, I'd like to stop to give room for questions and comments. Oh, yeah, sorry. Let me quickly look to talk about this. You know, we talked about individual investment and we talked about ETFs. So this is a, an example of an ETF. So this is S&P 500 ETF. Um, this is investing in, so if you're buying this one, this one stock, so to speak, you'll be buying shares of the, the largest 500 company in America instead of buying individual. Now, this is trading at $263. Um, 
it fell. I mean, the bottom was really on March 23rd. It was $200.55 on March 23rd. Look at it. Maybe less than a month after, it's trading at 263. So stocks can be very, whether it's individual or ETF, they can be very lucrative. But again, they are highly, highly volatile. They can go up so much in so short a time, and they can come down so much in so short a time. So they are not best for short-term investment. They are better for long-term investment. So invest wisely and responsibly. God bless us. So uh, thank you for that, uh, for, for really uh, going uh, at that level of detail and very high level as well. Uh, if you have questions, please uh, type it in the chat box. Again, you know, Coyote uh, is based in New York. Um, after this meeting, uh, you know, we'll have an email address up as well. Uh, if you just want to connect with him, um, please let us know. Uh, privately, he's also a tax professional based in New York. Is what you call uh, an enrolled agent. So an enrolled agent is a person. So think of a CPA as an accountant. Um, he's an enrolled agent for for tax. So put your questions in the box, and then we'll we'll get to them in the general questions. Thank you, Kyrie. Welcome. So next, Thank you. Um, my pleasure. So next, we'll go over to real estate, and then uh, with precious. And then we'll we'll get to the market drivers. So Kadi has given a lot of the numbers, a lot of you know, the trends, what we're seeing. The question is, what actually drives this thing, right? And, and that's really, really, really important. Uh, so Dick and Akin will be leading us with that uh, once Precious uh, takes us through real estate. So Precious, uh, let me make sure I have unmuted you, and you can go ahead, please. Just a second. Okay, you're you're good. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Yep. All right, well, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Precious Oko. And first of all, I'd like to say the last speaker, Kayo, did that was a fantastic presentation. I personally learned a lot, so thank you for that. Thank um, you. But thanks, <laughs> sure. Thanks, everyone, for having me. And uh, thank you to my friend, Kumale, for the opportunity to come tonight and just rub minds with you all on a topic mm -hmm. that near and dear to my heart as I'm actually learning more about it myself from my own personal experience. So just a very brief intro about me. I am located in Houston, Texas. And like Kunle shared earlier, I did graduate from Ohio State. My background is in engineering. And while I studied at OSU, I was actually a member of the of Triumphant Tra Chapel. And um, so engineer by training, I also do have an MBA and I work in the petrochemical industry here in Houston. So that's just a bit about me. So before I get started, <laughs> let me just put a disclaimer out there that I'm not a financial advisor or a real estate investment uh, professional by any stretch of the imagination. So my discussion today is really based on my own experience in this space. And I think sometimes it's valuable to to hear from someone else who has gone into things and you know there might be one or two things to learn from that person's experience all right so jumping into real estate investing a couple of uh, a couple of points or a couple of things i'll talk about before we jump into the slides um i'll first of all touch on the overarching why so why real estate and then i'll move into talking about the benefits of investment properties we'll talk about why now why could you know why would now be a good time or not um and then we'll talk about precautions before investing in real estate and finally some considerations uh when you think about income generating sources so like home flipping vacation rentals and long-term rentals those just some general consideration just for uh for your awareness so to start with the overarching why you know i think when i think of real estate I think a lot of people, um, the reason why a lot of people would go into that is really two big things. One is the potential for appreciation and cash flow. So again, I'll use the word potential. In general, when you think on the long run, so in investing, I like to think long-term, right? So when you think long-term, in general, houses do appreciate over time in general. Now, of course, there could be 
dips in the market from time to time where you know prices fall like you know back in 0809 uh, but in general if you bought a house in 2000 and this is 2020 uh, very very likely you your house would have appreciated over that period of time so that's one of the main reasons why people think of real estate investment um, appreciation over time and of course cash flow you know if you if you are successful in renting out your property uh, you know you'd expect to get some level of cash flow over time as well all right then benefits of invest you know investing in an investment property uh, I already talked on the two big ones, but some other things, some other things to think about as far as benefits. One is it's easy to understand. And, you know, uh, the last speaker, Kaido, was talking about asset classes. You know, he talked about equity, you know, stocks, mutual funds, ETFs. Um, not everyone really can wrap their heads around trading in the stock market, for example. Uh, you know, he talked about you, you have to make sure you do your research and you have to make sure you know what you're doing. Otherwise, you're just buying random stocks based on emotion and, you know, you could lose money. It's a very volatile market as well. Um, so with real estate, I think one draw potentially for a lot of people, for some people, is that it's easy, right? It's easy to think about the concept. So basically, you buy a property, hopefully for a good price, you maybe rent it out over time and you get cash flow from it and you pay back the mortgage over time and maybe hopefully the tenant even you know pays your pays off your mortgage for you over time you know so that's pretty easy for people to understand in terms of you know investing in in uh, in, in a property another point is uh, it's a great way to generate passive income so usually when you when you are invested in real estate and you have for example you take the the route of putting a tenant there right and you sign like a one year lease or something you're you're not actively in, you know actively uh in investing over time you've made the investment and now you're generating cash flow from a passive perspective so as long as you know maybe maintenance issues are taken care of and things like that or the house is maybe even new so you don't even have such issues you're getting income without actively doing something every day. So a lot of people find that attractive as active, uh, as a, you know, a, a way to generate passive income. And then another one could be tax incentives. And I, a lot of people probably don't really think about this, but, you know, especially if you make a lot of money from maybe your regular work or other businesses that you have, or, you know, the things you have going on, if you earn a lot of, uh, if you're high on the income bracket, in, income tax bracket, your investment in real estate could actually help you from a tax incentive perspective and you know of course to get into the details of that talk to your tax accountant or you know coyote as coolly <laughs> said he's a he's a registered agent um and then you know hedge against inflation is another consideration when you think of the benefits for uh real uh real estate investment so now jumping into timing. So why now? Why could now maybe be a good time to invest? So if you think about what's going on from a macroeconomic level, uh, really a lot of people have lost their jobs, right? Over the last few weeks here, you know, when you think about the unemployment numbers, and there was a huge, another huge wave again that just came in uh, in terms of the number of people filing for unemployment in millions altogether. Um, a lot of people have lost their work. And so when you combine that with uncertainty in the marketplace right now, um, uncertainty about having a job tomorrow, oil price dip, if you're in oil and gas upstream, very likely, you know, there's the concern of insolvency with your company. So with all of that, people are holding on to their money when they can right now. And so why this could be potentially a good time and i'm not going to say yes or no that's you know you decide but why it could potentially be a good time is that a lot of people are holding on to their funds because of all the uncertainty and so if you are a seller today you very likely are you know either keeping your price the same or reducing your price you're not trying to go up in price because no one is going to buy it right now and so because of all the all of those dynamics you know right now there's a really strong potential for the market to reprice or correct itself 
And with that, we are in a, we're entering or we're in a buyer's market. So if you have the cash and let's say this is something you've already thought about before now, right? So you already have your, your financial picture in a good place. You've been thinking of real estate, you've done your homework. This might actually be a good time because there are not a lot of people that just have the money to put in. So if you're negotiating with a seller right now, you have some leverage. So that's, in summary, why it could be a good time to think about investing, especially if you've already been thinking about it before now, this might be a good time to jump in. And the market rates are still low. I think I heard in, you know, going forward, maybe in the next few weeks, there might be some changes, with, not necessarily with the rates, but with the requirements from the banks. They might tighten things up a bit. Um, but anyway, for right now, mortgage rates are still low and we're still in a buyer's market. So this could be a good time. Now, moving on to the next slide, uh, let's talk about some, okay, talk about some precautions before investing. One of the big ones I like to highlight, you know, when you think of real estate is it's very illiquid. So liquidity is, you know, in very high term, um, very high, on a very high level, it's how easy is it to turn your investment into cash? If you need cash tomorrow, how easy is it to get your cash out? Real estate is on the extreme end of that spectrum. It's not easy at all. So if you had invested in, you know, maybe any of the other asset classes like equity, or, you know, where you have, maybe you bought some stocks of some company and tomorrow you need the money for whatever reason, you can log back into your account and, you know, sell and, you know, get whatever it's trading for at that time. But with real estate, it's very illiquid. So it's a big consideration for you. You have to ensure that this money you're putting in, this is not something you're planning to take out in two weeks or in one month or in three months. Think of it more of a long term, except of course, if you're planning to flip the house or you're, maybe you're buying a distressed property, you're gonna fix it up and sell. Uh, that's different, but in general, it's very illiquid. So that's something to think about. And then also, of course, return on investment is never guaranteed with, you know, most investments so in real estate, um, return on investment is not guaranteed. So I would suggest if you're planning to go into real estate to, you know, maybe rent out, make sure you have beyond just having like your down, your, your, you know, your down payments and all of that closing costs, make sure you have, I would say about six months of, uh, you know, if your mortgage costs in cash set aside because there's always the potential that you purchase a property and I've had such experience from my, you know, this is my own personal experience. I've had that a couple of years ago, but there's always a potential where you purchase a property and you have a uh, delay in <laughs> your tenants making payments or they just don't and you can't evict them just the same day, etc. So make sure you have cash um, if you're trying to go into um, into real estate investment. And another consideration as well, the third point on this slide, you know, think about maybe, especially if you're planning to do this long-term, you're planning to maybe have a couple of properties, you might wanna set up an LLC. So this is to protect yourself now. You know, if let's say a tenant sleep and he and falls in your property or somebody does, you know, can they come after you and sue you for everything you own versus going after the LLC if the, if the investment property is tied under or is registered under an LLC that you set up, right? So that's another consideration, of course, having enough insurance. And I'm not talking about homeowner's insurance. This is more so, you know, like an umbrella insurance coverage to protect, again, you and your other sources of income. So just some considerations to think about. And then I think I have one or two more slides. Let's see. Can we... Okay. So some considerations when you think about the different ways um, that you could generate funds or generate cash flow um, when you have an investment property. You know, typically you think of maybe flipping a house, buying a distressed property, like I mentioned, and you know, upgrading it and then selling it for a profit. Sounds really great, and you can actually make a lot of money doing that but it's a lot of work. It could take a lot of work, especially if you are planning to actively participate in the upgrade. So if you're maybe planning to actually put some sweat equity into it, so you're you know, breaking down the walls and you're fixing things yourself in addition to maybe a contractor, um, it could take a lot of work. 
if you plan to just have a contractor do it, very likely, you know, that would eat really greatly into your profit because, you know, in the U.S., labor cost is really, really high. And so you have to make sure you have a contractor that's priced reasonably. Make sure you think about all of that before going to buy such property uh, if you're planning to do a flip. Okay. And then the next one, because of our time here, the next one is when you think of maybe other ways to generate that cash flow when you have an investment property. So let's say you're doing, you're thinking of a short term or a vacation right, um, home rental. And personally, I do this, I do Airbnb. Um, some tips for you. The main thing is do your research. Um, uh, there's nothing like getting a home, you know, for a vacation rental and, you know, no one, no one wants to stay in that neighborhood. Right. And a lot of people that, a lot of people that book vacation rentals do so because, you know, they're on vacation. So, uh, typically people want to stay in a, in a good, a great part of town, maybe a place near a lot of attractions, things like that. So if you got a house for a short term right now and it's in the middle of you know nowhere in the in the boonies or something uh, it might be it might be a challenge for you to get uh, 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 guests to stay there so do your research about the location and that's where again location is key that's really huge and you know when you think about okay when you think about um, short term right now like you know, if you're thinking of Airbnb things like that uh, think about your proximity as well to the place, because uh, if you are managing it yourself, you might need to be able to go there on very short notice if there are issues with the guests, etc. cetera. Um, if, you, if you outsource the management of it, again, that eats into your profits or something else for you to think about. So overall, I would say, you know, real estate could be a great investment vehicle, especially when you're thinking long term. But I think the key is making sure you do your research, really understand your strategy going into it. And again, it's not just about making a, an investment or having the money to make that in investment, but you also have to have some extra to cover for all the unforeseen that you could get into um, if you're not able to generate cash flow as, as fast as you'd like to. But in summary, it's always a really great way to um, generate passive income and, you know, in general, real estate appreciates over time. All right, Kunle, back to you. Thank you so much. Uh, my pleasure. Thank you again, uh, Precious, for, for that presentation. That is excellent. Um, again, if you have questions, please put them in the comment section. Um, we can also take them at the end just to save time. And and up next is, you know, you know, someone I think most of us on this call is very familiar with. Um, he, he was a deacon in our local church here, uh, here in Triumphant Chapel. Uh, he's moved to Texas now. I'm trying to find him on the list so I can unmute him. I think his, his wife joined by grace. Yeah, you can use my wife's uh, Oh, you're up. I can hear you. All right. So I'm using my wife's name. So right. Grace. So he's married. So that's the most I can say about it. So Dick and I can please introduce yourself and, and get us started on, on what drives the market. All right. So I'm I, so I'm the I'm pop, I'm gonna be the one that will wrap it up and this is the last section before the questions answers so i'm not going to spend a lot of time on the deck and for those of you that really know me i'm not i'm not a deck uh, powerpoint person so but i'll go to some bullet points here um just and let me I, I think like the the previous presenter said i will say the same thing i'm not a financial advisor and so by no means you take any of my advice and, and, and say, yeah, that is what the advisor said. No, um, this is from experience, from my own personal experience, from, you know, from just being around and the things that I've done. That's the thing that I'm going to share with you on, on doing this presentation. Um, uh, yeah, like you said, I'm, I'm Akinai Mubala. And um, so not by any means representing my company. So on this call, since you're recording it, so I'm not representing my my employers. This is just me, you know, presenting and sharing my valuable advice with friends and families. Um, so markets, what drives the market? I think that's a, that's very important, correct? But before I go into that, though, 
A couple of things I want to touch on from what uh, Kyle Day and Priscilla said, I will, and that I want to kind of emphasize, if you will. Uh, I know you be, and he said it too. Be careful, be very thoughtful, and be strategic about what you want to invest in the industry, the markets that you want to invest in. Uh, understand your risk tolerance, right, and be. Make sure that you can absorb it, uh, because if you can absorb, if you cannot absorb, I can tell you that in one month, or yeah, I, I would say a couple of months ago, I lost almost hundred thousand dollars just just in a couple of months, in just in a couple of days, right? And, but do you have can you have absorbed that? Can you take that in your you know in your financial capacity and based on what you have in your bank account? And can you, if your, you know, your, your budget, can your budget absorb that, correct? Or are you in it for a long time, correct? So I said I lost on the thousand dollars, almost on the thousand dollars. I'll tell you that I made, made some of those back in a couple of days as well, correct? So, but if I'm depending on that stock market to feed my family, to pay my mortgage, to pay my rent, uh, to pay my car notes, to pay my student loan, then you can be rest assured in that four weeks or five weeks when I was losing money, there's no income, there's no way I can, you know, sustain that. So just understand yourself, understand your pocket, uh, your pocket, understand where you are, understand your financial capacity. The second thing I would say is that I think the starting point is you have to even have a budget, and uh, you have to understand. Okay, can you do you even have a budget? You have something to invest in because if you don't have an budget and you don't have a residual income or leftover to invest in, I will question you for even talking about investment. So for those of us on this call today, I want to challenge you. When you have a moment, sit down and think about your budget. Think about your budget and think about how much is coming in and how much that you're going to be spending, how much you're spending and what is your leftover. Uh, like Priscilla said, the, the previous presenter, at a minimum, you need to have almost six months of savings, correct, of your monthly expense. You need to save six months of your monthly expense. That's the starting point. Before you can go to all this investment that we're talking about, all this stock market equity and real estate, I want to take, your, take a good care of yourself first. Look at your portfolio. Look at your income. Look at your income stream. And uh, if you're married, your wife and your uh, his wife or husband, you're making money, you have dual income. Come, you know, what's your budget around that? You know, you know. Earlier on in my relation, in, in my marriage, my wife and I, we always plan around, you know, spending on one income, just because anything can happen. And by the grace of God, you know, we've been blessed to both have jobs, uh, you know, throughout our lives. But from the, uh, from get going, we've always known that we're gonna plan. Our budget is gonna be on one income, assuming that one person of the family is working. That's what the budget is always going to be on. And that's what we're going to spend. Guess what? Whatever that is left, the other person's income goes automatically goes into savings every year for us. And that depends where we're going to live. That depends, you know, uh, where the vacation time and what we're going to spend and, and things like that. Because we plan that everything that we're going to do is going to be based on one person's income. I'm not saying that you should do that for your family. I'm, what I'm saying, though, is that make sure you have and make sure that you have a reserve in that budget before you start talking about, you know, investing in stock and or in real estate. Now, so let me then go back to my side of the talk, you know, the presentation, which is market drivers. What are the things that normally would drive the market? So the first thing is that it's a simple thing. So a lot of things I have here that are very simple and straightforward. The first one is sales and demand, that demand and supply. You all know it that time. So I, I know my brother talked about Apple, talked about some other stocks that are doing really well. What I didn't see him talk about is the healthcare industry. And you can be rest assured that the winner is post COVID-19, it's gonna be healthcare industry. And you can be rest assured. So start thinking about that, the healthcare industry. Start thinking about companies that are pharmaceutical companies because they're going to be the winners post COVID-19. What about the technology companies? You know, they're gonna be winners, you know, at the end of the COVID-19. Look at what is happening with work from home. 
look at what is happening with virtual work environment. So those companies that invest in those areas and then enabling that capabilities, enabling, enabling that solution, start thinking about those companies because they would drive the market post COVID-19. So understanding the sales side, understanding demand is very, very critical. Understand the ability to determine which company is gonna drive that story you know, next month, in the next year. And, and you can see it when, when, you, when you, if you, you're like me, you listen to news, you read a lot, then you can see the trend coming. You can see, you know, the trend coming, you know, even with COVID-19, I think some people, they were on top of it and they sold their stock before the, the market crash, you know, in the March time frame. Why? Because it was stubborn the market, they've seen the trend of it. You can see it from the tone of leadership. You can stay from political landscape that based on what is going on now, something is going to happen. And then that will determine when do you want to get in the market again? Remember, you have to have the fund to do it because like the book, uh, how they said, it's win or lose, correct? So you could get into it and, and you could lose everything that you put into it or you could also gain as well. So make sure that you have the fund and the capability to do that. So. The second thing is the workforce, correct? So understand, you know, and, and, and it goes back to my example of what is going to happen post COVID-19. You know, people are figuring it out now. They're figuring out that I can actually work from home. I can be productive work from home. I don't have to be in the building. You know, the kind of talent that we're going to be attract, that we're attracting post COVID-19. Even look at, look, at, look at our kids, look at our children. For those of you that have elementary students at home, Look at doing this time, online, you know, distant learning. You know, my kids now can type fluently on computer, you know, go into a to to word document and send email or attach document. They learn that in a couple of days, you know, and that will become our future workforce, correct? And they're picking this up at the age of five or six or seven, and they've they've become a future workforce. And so we need to understand that. And be able to say what is going on how do i what do i need to do to cater for this you know group of people and because that's going to drive the stock going up and what is the company doing to cater for their employees to cater for their workforce manufacturing is another area that drives the market we are obviously know that and i'm going to combine manufacturing with supply chain and distribution you obviously know by this time that with COVID 19 with what is happening now, it's been a disruption in the supply chain, you know, and, and also in manufacturing, and it's already there today, correct? And so companies that are not on top of it, they don't they don't have a robust system, and they don't have a robust pipeline, they're gonna struggle post COVID-19, they're gonna lose. And you can see that, I challenge you to read about that in new, in, in, you know, look at all the manufacturing companies of the, in the industry that you wanna invest in. Look at them, look at how they are reacting now. Look at the technology that they have. Look at their platform, look at the solution that they have. Look at some of them have a manual process that they wouldn't survive post COVID-19. And some of them, they already have a robust technology uh, in, 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 in platform and capability that we enable them to survive post COVID-19. What about supply chain? That's another thing. Look at those distributors and, and supply chain companies. And look at some of them to so look at what they are doing look at how they are treating their employees look at what the employees are saying about them because that's going to be the, the winners and the loser after this COVID 19. it's going to be determined by okay which company do you want to work for because people are going to some companies are going to lose and some are going to win so just understanding that and say okay what is going on in the industry that i want to invest in 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 pharmaceutical industry in you know healthcare industry what is going on there? Who are the key players? There? Who are the manufacturers? There? Who are the supply, you know, the supply, the distributors in that industry? And what do I need to do? And how do I play in there? What are they doing to respond to, to, to what is going on now? Are they providing solution? Are they helping out? And because that's going to drive the market. Because we are, you know, the more the more solution that you're offering, the more you're going to generate more income. Right? It's all about that's all about the market where you, you offer a solution and people come in to buy that solution and in turn, you make more money. And when you make more money, then it's gonna impact your stock uh, and, and, and your performance and, 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 you know, in the, in, in your, the performance of your stock. All right, 
Let's go to the next one, please. All right, so when to invest? You know, again, no insider trading here, and I'm just telling you when to invest. You understand the market. It's the same thing with the previous slide. You have to understand what is, what's going on in, your, in the macro economy and what's going on in the micro economy. Very, very important that you understand that. And what I mean by that is that in your local environment, you know, in your city, in your neighborhood, what's going on there? And what's also going on in, in the political landscape? What's going on with the election, right? In November, we're going to have an election. What's going on? How, how does Democrats approach the market and the strategy? And how does, you know, the Republican you know, Party approach the market? What, does, what would that mean if, if, you know, Biden won the election or if, uh, if Donald Trump became, a, a, you know, a one re election? What's going to happen? How would the market react to that? What is going to happen today about different drug that is going to, that, that the man pharmaceutical company will you know will produce or, or will come to market with that will solve this problem of COVID nineteen? Start thinking about the macro economy of how everything is connected, the political landscape, the you know the, the your city, your your, your 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 state, and how everything is connected, and also your, in the micro economy, your own family. In your environment, in your you know, in your in your own little industries, in your church, in your neighborhood, start thinking about the new things that you that is going on there. Right now, you know, imagine what I'm, how much Amazon is making now. Imagine how much Amazon is making. I guarantee you, 10, 15 years ago, people are looking at Amazon. What is this? You know, and, and, but now look at that. Look at they don't have any disruption. They keep making money. Why? Because they have platform. That is enabling them to do that. So start thinking about that. You know, both the macro, not just the macro economy, but also the micro economy of what is going on around you, and that should determine when you should jump into the market and and, and invest. You know, the second thing is about invention and innovation. You know, you probably hearing about some companies that are investing in new things, investing in new technology. Look at Zoom and look at some other things. Let me tell you something. You know, with work from home, with virtual working from home, you know, Microsoft is playing there, Zoom is playing there, uh, WebEx is playing in that market, Cisco is playing in that market. Guess what? There's going to be new company because guess what? Big Fortune 500 we run into those big companies, correct? But there will still be some small companies that only have 50 people or 30 people, and they still need their capability. They still need to do this virtual working, virtual meetings, and virtual team meetings. See how you can play in that area. See whether you can write a code. See whether some of your friends can write a code. See even in Africa. Look at Africa. You know, you know, it's, it, Africa is going to become a big, you know, a coming, you know, a, a, a big driver. In, in how we go to, in how we, you know, the, the, in, the, in the economic landscape. And what are you doing about that? You know, something is a platform that you know now. Look at it and take, take advantage of that. And then the last thing I will say is that when you come up with that invention, you see new registration, the new patent being registered, new ideas, new companies are coming in with great ideas. They are potential company to invest in. Their stock is probably going to start at a very, very low level. You know, the companies that um, Carl did mention, I wish you can see when they started and see how much they were, you know, they went, yeah, you know, they went live with at the beginning and see how much they have now. So look for those companies and, and try to take advantage of that and invest in it. At the end of the day, the most important thing is this, make sure that you, you have enough, you start with the budget. Important, if you have a leftover, don't depend on investment. Don't, it's not something that you will invest and say, I will use that to pay for my mortgage. I will use that to pay for my student loan tomorrow or when it comes. No, that's not about, if you're still doing that, no, 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 please don't do that. But make sure you have enough leftover residual income, whatever that is left invested, it's going to go. Over time, it's going to go. And keep investing, keep finding new companies and, and, and then keep putting your money out there. And you know, real estate, like my sister said, take advantage of it. Whatever that you need to do, take advantage of it. Over time, though, it will go and it will come back, and you will definitely look back and say you've made the right decision. All right, uh, I'm gonna hand over, turn over to Kule. Uh, questions. Yeah, 
Excellent. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that, sir. So if you have questions, uh, you can use the uh, either the chat box. You can raise your hand as well, and I can unmute you if you want to ask a question directly. Um, and we can take those questions uh, really quickly. So we can ask questions around equities and stocks. Um, Kaede, if you're there, the first question that I got, and this is directly from my wife, so I'm just gonna uh, you know, read it out. Um, okay. She asked, you know, you said, you know, if you lose money in, in, in stocks and it's tax deductible, what exactly does that mean, tax deductible? Okay, so at the end of every year, if you sold any stocks and you lost the money, if you're filing single up to 1500 of that loss you can use to write off your earned income so let's say you made fifty thousand dollar for the year you're supposed to pay taxes on fifty thousand dollars but because you had a loss on your stock for fifteen hundred you can actually use that loss to reduce your income by 1500. So you're actually taxed on 48,500. The same with your gain. If you gained, say you gain 1,500 in the market, and then you made 50,000 on your job, your taxable income, taxable for lack of a better word, would be that income on your W-2 and the gain on the market. So either way, the loss, it's taxable if you have the gain is taxable if it's a gain if it's a loss it reduces your taxable income from your duty or your other jobs yeah I, I, don't you know we had to that you know thank you i mean i it, can, can you hear me yep yeah. all right so don't you know we asked that is that hey be you know i know when we talk about investment and uh, taxable in, in investment with in, in income uh, capital income, investment income, be careful for those of you that goes into real estate. Yeah, your your losses also is deductible, but it's to a certain level, right? So it, it's not all deductible. So yeah. it's carried over, it's match, you're gonna match that against the, your yeah. investment income. And so so again, you will still have been there. I've, I've rented property in my, so I've done, been there, done that, and it's just be, you know that yeah it's deductible but to so for some classes it's maxed out based on your investment income yep hi i have a quick question yep uh my name is roland Agedion. in order for someone to start investing in stocks equities don't you think it's advisable for them to take advantage of their 401k um because um they're still gonna have like a um Match up with the company is uh, you know have taking advantage of your 401k once you have already uh, invested fully that you can take a bad investing in other equities yeah yeah i don't think that's a question i think that's the right thing to say I, it personally it's just a good advice it's a good place to start investing start with the 401k okay. and that's for the long term and if you like like uh, if, you say, if you, your budget allows for it then you can do some other type of investing but it should be in addition to your 401k yeah, yeah because the reason i ask is because most people are here are the don't know more about investment. So I think we should put that first, um, just for them to know about the 401k, taking advantage of the 401k before jumping into investment, investing in other equities. So I just wanted to put that here. I 100% agree with you, my brother. I think that, like, like how they said, that's not even a question. That's a, you should be another presenter. So you should right. just tell us that. So that's not a question. So I think yeah, so the more, that that if i may jump in real quickly that's actually on on one of the slides that i cover so as you can see there's a 401k brokerage platform so we'll get to that you know in a, in a minute okay. yeah oh yep. okay yep. I, th I think the the only thing i will quickly say to that is just you know my note but only you probably will cover it but make sure that you max out when you are doing 401k with your company some company will match 4% or 5%, some companies match 
Now, I'm telling you, they will match 8%. That is free money. So max it out, correct? Max it out under percent. I will also challenge you. This is another thing that I will challenge you to do. Get your 401k. Every year, with some companies, they give you a 3% increase in salary, correct? Merit increase, correct? You get merit increase in salary. Okay. Every year when you have that increase, use that something to increase your 401k contribution. Add another 1%. Add another 1%. Add enough, another 50 basis points. You know, that year. Don't take out the entire 3% increase home every year. Because if you have a good budget, then that 3% is probably free money for you at that time. Whatever it is, $50, $100, just increase your 401k with that. So remember, it's a free money. And, and and it's going to come back in huge return over time. Thank you for that. Um, there's a question in the chat room, and, and Precious, uh, if you can hear me, uh, if you try to, if you can take this, it says uh, for for investing in real estate in rental properties, what are your thoughts on condos versus mi- single slash multifamily homes? Pros and cons. What are your thoughts? Okay, um, so as far as condos versus single family homes, I think maybe one of the questions one has to ask is the what's your intent? What's your intent with even the investment in the first place? I would say, and I'm in Texas, so I don't know the situation in Ohio, but here, at least in the Houston area where I am, with condos, you there's a lot of um, the HOA fees, homeowners association fees are very high for condos in the past and it just wasn't it just didn't really make sense for my situation again because of those fees i mean you have to pay that on a monthly basis that eats out of your um out of your your potential profit so it all depends on your particular scenario in your market and so that's why you know going back to do your research in your particular uh, market what kind of fees would come along with having such a property so here condos versus um, single family homes is a very very big difference in how much you have to shell out every month for hoas and so for me it wasn't really a lucrative investment excellent thank you um another question and this may be for karade uh he says i didn't hear anything about cryptos are they viable investments Oh, yeah, very much so. Um, but the thing with uh, crypto, like any other thing, is it's, well, more, more than stocks. Those are very complex. You need to really understand it. I mean, there's the mining, there is the side of it that you really need to understand before you get into the world of crypto. I have clients that buy and that trade in crypto. They make money and they lose money. So more it's more complex just know that do a lot of research before you get into it but like any other investment you can make money from it you can lose money from it underlining purpose um man understand it before you get into it and and maybe a follow-up question to that number one what is cryptocurrency for those that don't know number two you know there's another question in the chat room it says what are your thoughts on roth ira and maybe you can also go into a traditional ira as well Let's talk about the old IRA and what is cryptocurrency exactly. So the Roth IRA, basically Roth IRA, traditional IRA. Um, so uh, they are investment vehicle where you can hold your investment. So uh, every year uh, there is a six thousand dollar limit on IRA accounts. I mean it increases every year, maybe by five hundred. I think this year the limit is six thousand five hundred. So if you do the traditional IRA, you are putting the money in the account before taxes. So you save on your taxes. If your income is 50,000, your W-2 income is 50,000. If you put $5,000 in an traditional IRA account, you only pay taxes on $45,000. So you don't pay taxes on the money in your traditional IRA until you take it out with and the money in your ira you can invest it in stocks you can invest it in cryptocurrency if you want you can invest it anyhow you want you can invest it in mutual funds you can invest it in etf you can invest it anyhow you like um the so iras are really very for holding uh, 
your investment. Uh, the Roth IRA, the difference is that Roth IRA is an after-tax money. So when you invest, when you put your money in Roth IRA, you already pay taxes on the money, and then you put the after-tax money in the Roth IRA. At the end, when you take out the Roth IRA money, provided you have left the money in there for five years, and you are 59 years and a half, you get to take out your investment tax free. Just, it's just a matter of when do you want to pay the tax? Do you want to pay the taxes before making the investment, or do you want to pay the taxes after making the investment, realizing your stuff? So a lot of young it's it makes a lot of sense if you are a low income earner, or if you're not a very high income earner to do Roth IRA, because there's a uh, income restriction. You make too much money, you're not eligible for something. So that's what I would say. Uh, cryptocurrency, um, it's another, if you think about it, it's a, you know you have paper money, and there's the other type of money, basically. It's cryptocurrency. It's how you buy and sell without paper money. It's another form of money. And people invest in it, you know, just like they invest in the forex market. It's a lot to understand. I mean, we can't unpack it in this. If you want to learn more about cryptocurrency, I would say, you know, just jump online, read up about it. But there's a lot of uh, uh, there's a lot of prospect for gain in it, but you really need to understand it. And I'm not an expert in it, so I can't really speak much to it. Excellent. Thank you. Um, any other questions in the chat box? If you want to, oh, there is a question. Um, so there's a question about platform. I'll talk, I'll speak to that in a minute. And then what do you think about, uh, okay, so let's just go to that to answer these questions that are on, on, on the chat. So I'll go to these uh, slides really quickly, right? And, and the question is, how do I get started, right? As you can hear, you know, from really the three facilitator, Kyrie Day, Precious, and Bikinakin, number one is do your due diligence. In other words, don't just go out, yes, now I have 50K, let me go buy into uh, real estate, or let me put this $50,000 into a Roth or a mutual funds or the stock market. Do your due diligence first. And that's where the whole market drivers comes in, right? What's driving the market? For example, if Apple CEO tomorrow morning, we find out that he raped a girl when he was 40 years old. More than likely, Apple stocks would probably take a big hit by Monday morning, right? Um, again, what's happening? You know, it goes back again, demand, supply and demand. What's driving the market? Uh, do you really understand the company that you're, you're, you're really investing in? So do your due diligence. Uh, number two is sign up with a broker, right? So what does sign up with a broker mean? Meaning, you can't take your money today and go to McDonald's and say, hey, McDonald's, I want to buy some of your shares or I want to buy stocks in your company. You have to buy through a platform. And that's where the, some of the questions on the, on, the, uh, on, the, uh, on the chat is coming through. And I'll let Kyrie speak to that a little bit in a second. So the question was, you know, what are your thoughts about using maybe Cash App? Um, or some of these new platforms that are just uh, springing for. So I'll show you my next slide. So what are some of the trading platforms you can use? Meaning you have money today, you want to buy Coca-Cola stocks or, or Apple or Chipotle. Um, and, and this has really gotten a lot easier over time, right? Uh, Robin Hood um, being one of them. So the one on the center page of this screen, um, is one of those platforms that allows you to buy stocks directly. You could, you know, and, and it's free. So, you know, Kaide talks a lot, he talked about, you know, commissions and fees. So Robinhood actually makes it free for you, right, to, to do that. And you could buy on this platform. Uh, Cash App, uh, to my left, um, and I know that came up in the chat as well. I'll let Kaide opine on, on these platforms as well. Um, the advantage of Cash App, so this is brand new. As you can see there, the way they market in this is starting and start investing with your favorite company with as little as one dollar, right? So, for example, Kaide showed Chipotle stocks being trading at nine hundred dollars a share today. You know, you can probably jump on Cash App and buy a piece of that for a dollar. So, of course, your percentage, your percent ownership is going to be point zero 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 zero. It's going to be very very small. So, but again, these are platforms that you could use. Stash is another platform that you could use as well. Um, 
you know, I don't have a picture of that application, but that's another application. And on this screen here, so Brother Roland brought up a very excellent point about 401k. Um, so 401k essentially is, you know, you employ, you, you work with a company and the company has a 401k benefit, meaning um, before we tax your salary, we'll take out whatever you want us to take out, 3%, 5%. And whatever we take out, we'll match it. You know, for example, the company I work with now, first three percent, they'll match it dollar for dollar. Meaning, if I contribute fifty dollars into my four hundred one k every two weeks, they'll equally put an additional fifty dollars. And if I go over that three percent, they'll contribute maybe I think four and a half percent, right? So not dollar for dollar. So it kind of you know shakes out to about four point five percent I think overall, at least for me. And I could do more. I could do ten percent. I could do fifteen percent of my income. So on that platform, so your company will use a platform. So my company today uses Fidelity. I've worked with other employees in the past that uses Vanguard. So your employer will use, you know, a broker. You could use, you could get on that same broker website and sign up for, you know, either your own Roth IRA account or your own personal investment account, and you could start trading through those through that account. Um, again, this is really to piggyback to Brother Roland's point about, you know, leveraging your four hundred one k. Um, you know, from a stock, mutual fund, a mutual fund, all the things Sky Day talked about. Um, and also I have on this, go ahead. Oh, sorry. So also on this list is, you know, what are the other alternatives? So I don't, of course, I don't want to read them out. There's a bunch of other alternative platforms you could use. Uh, when we send out this deck, you know, that link will literally take you to a list of other um other brokerage platforms that you could use. Uh, some of them have beautiful applications that are very intuitive. Some of them is really a website, you know, the old old school website, or you could go to um, a broker in person. Um, you know, some of them, you know, I see some on the East Coast where you could go to the kind of like a storefront, and then you could talk to a, an advisor there and they could kind of walk you through, you know, what are you trying to invest in and how much is it gonna cost you to start investing, you know, in, in the market. So, Kaida, if you don't mind talking about maybe uh, an investing platform, if there's something I missed out, you know, just, you know, some of the ones that I shared. No, I think you did great. Uh, most of them now, well, they're very competitive now, so they, they're almost very similar in their offerings. I mean, they all, all of them now offers free trading. As early as last year, I was using mainly um uh, merrill lynch i was trading through merrill lynch and each time i trade whether i buy or sell i was paying six dollars and 95 six dollars and 95 cents per transaction and then some of these smaller apps came and they were free now the even the big guys merrill lynch tax club and vanguard they're now free and right. most of these are uh, stash and Robin Hood, they let you buy fractional share, like Kunle said. So the offerings are now almost the same. So you can probably, you know, pick anyone at random and start investing with them. But the other thing is reliability. I mean, they are not all at the same level of reliability. Even Robin Hood, as popular as it was, I think uh, sometime last month or two months ago, there was a day where nobody, paid, you know, Everybody was, everybody's account was out of whack. It was like someone hacked into them and people couldn't trade. So if you had stuff that you really wanted to sell, you couldn't sell it. If you had something that you wanted to buy, you couldn't buy, people lost a lot of money. A lot of people believe some of these other companies are not that reliable yet. That's a question, you know, for the experts. But I think on the average, they are all the same. They are all free, but you know, read up on the ratings the expert ratings to go with the best one excellent thank you and, and for 401k if i may chime in um of course you want to go back to your employee employee handbook or the benefits website of your employer to really understand you know what is your company offering right because it's very different for probably you know most company but of course every company is trying to be competitive in the market to attract talent so, you know, don't just take what I'm telling you, like everybody I've said on this call, um, really, you know, get back to your employer. Uh, if your 401k is uh, you're contributing 3%, you know, to Dickens point earlier, you know, is your, are, are you able to readjust your budget that you can contribute 10%, 
15%, or you can only do 2%. So really understanding that and really getting some, some, some handle around that. So any other questions? Yes, on sorry, Kule, Kule, can I quickly say something to that? Absolutely. I, I work for a retirement company, and what, part of what we do is manage 401k accounts. And one of the things, one of the things that we see for the most part, it's the easiest part is dedicating a portion of your salary to your 401k. But the investment choices in your 401k, many people shy from that. They just put the money in their 401k and they're not delegating how the money should be invested. And what your 401k company will do is they will put that money in the safest vehicle available because they don't want to lose your money. They are not going to put it in the most profitable, which is also subject to fluctuations. So be proactive. Don't just um, uh, dedicate a portion of your salary to 401k. Also, take time to make the investment choices. If you really don't know what you're doing, seek expert opinion to make your investment choices. Don't let your choice be the default one. The default one is not always the best. Excellent. Another question um, is, if you don't have an employer that offers 401k, can you get 401k? Yes, uh, there is solo 401k. So if you don't have an employer, basically, you are working for yourself, right? It, as a business person, you can open what is called a solo 401k, which means a self-employed 401k. And you can open with any of these company, Vanguard, Merrill Lynch, they have it. And then you can also open a IRA in addition to the 401k. Excellent, thank you. Any other questions? Um, if there are no more other questions, just a few housekeeping. Um, we want to thank really every single person on this call for making this very interactive. Um, obviously, great kudos to the panel. Uh, Precious, uh, thank you so much uh, for really you know sparing you know this time to to come talk to us. Uh, Kyle Day, thank you. Uh, Deacon, Deacon, thank you, thank you, thank you. I think we'll have maybe a question. Um, let me just, okay. The question is 401k versus 403b. Can you please explain the difference? So it really depends on the organization that you work for. So a private organization would have 401k. That's the name of the plan. It's just the name, basically. 403B is with a non-profit, yeah. educational institution, hospital, corporation, they will have 403B. 401K is for wow. private corporation, and there is 457, which is for state and local employers. And then there is the, um, the work for federal employers, uh, what is it called again? There's a name for it. So they're all the same thing, just depend on the employer that you have. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and, and finally, would love your feedback. Also, if you want this deck, if you want the slides, just send your email address to the phone number on the screen, 614-407-4421. Um, just send a quick uh, text uh, of your email address to that phone number, and we'll send you the deck. Uh, number two is, please, we would love your feedback, right? Uh, so please do us a favor, go to this website, feedback.lordsgenerals.org. And it's a Google form. It's very easy. So if you go to that website, feedback.lordsgenerals.org, um, let us know exactly, you know, how this went, you know, maybe some of your takeaways and then how the speakers did. And this would inform again, you know, how we, you know, conduct other future webinars. So again, if you please, we would really, really encourage you to give us feedback, uh, feedback.lordsgenerals.org. And again, if you want the slide, just text your email address to 614-407-4421. If you also need to speak to any of these three panelists, uh, you know, just send that to this text message as well, and we'll get you connected to, to them. All right. Thank you very, very much for your time. We really, really appreciate your time um, and for being here. Thank you and have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night.